Good day. I'm Dr. Rondilia from the Cardiology Section of the Department of Internal Medicine. For this lecture session, I will be talking about pericardial diseases. Before discussing the different disease entities, let us review first the anatomy and normal functions of the pericardium. The pericardium is also called the pericardial sac which is a double walled sac containing the heart and the roots of the great vessels. The pericardial sac has two layers, a serous, also called the visceral, and a fibrous, which includes the parietal pericardium. It encloses the pericardial cavity, which contains around 15 to 50 ml of pericardial fluid. What are the functions of the pericardium? It prevents sudden dilation of the cardiac chambers, minimizes friction between the heart and surrounding structures, prevents displacement of the heart and kinking of the vessels, and retards the spread of infection. Acute pericarditis is the most common pathologic process involving the pericardium. It has four principal diagnostic features, chest pain, pericardial friction rub, ECG changes, and pericardial effusion. Chest pain is described as pleuritic, radiates into either arm, or both arms. It is relieved by sitting up and leaning forward and is intensified by lying supine. Sometimes the pain is steady and radiates through the tra trapezius ridges or either arms and resemble myocardial ischemia or infarction. Differentiation from acute myocardial infarction is based on the typical character of pain and dissociation of extensive ST segment elevation with quite modest elevation of serum cardiac biomarkers. Pericardial friction rub at some point in the illness is heard in 85% of patients. It may have up to three components per cardiac cycle, is high pitch, and is described as rasping, scratching, or grating. It is heard most frequently at end expiration with the patient upright and leaning forward. ECG changes in the absence of massive effusion typically evolves through four stages. In stage one, there is widespread elevation of the ST segments, often with upward concavity in two or three standard limb leads and V2 to V6 in the precordial leads, with reciprocal depressions only in AVR and sometimes V1. Depression of the PR segment below the TP segment reflects the presence of atrial enlargement. This tracing shows diffuse ST elevation in leads 1, 2, 3, AVF, V2, to be 6 with upward concavity with reciprocal depression in AVR suggestive of acute pericarditis. Stage 2 is when the ST segments return to normal after several days. Stage 3, the T waves become inverted and stage 4, the ECG returns to normal in weeks or months. In contrast to acute myocardial infarction, 
ST elevation is upwardly convex with more prominent reciprocal depression and return to normal within a day or two. Q wave may develop with loss of R waves and amplitude usually seen within hours before ST segment become isoelectric. Pericardial effusion is associated with pain and or ECG changes as well as electrical alternance. Electrical alternance is due to the movement of the heart towards the anterior chest wall producing the large QRS complex and moving of the heart away from the chest wall producing the small QRS complexes. Heart sounds may be fainter with large pericardial effusion. Physical examination, a patch of dullness and increased fremitus beneath the angle of the left scapula can be appreciated. This is known as the Ewart sign. This figure shows you a chest x-ray finding in the presence of a large pericardial effusion. The cardiac silhouette is markedly enlarged with a water bottle configuration. Echocardiography is the most widely used imaging technique for detecting pericardial effusion. It is sensitive, is specific, simple, non-invasive, and may be performed at bedside. It can identify accompanying cardiac tamponade. It is seen as an echo-free space between the posterior pericardium and left ventricular epicardium. This image shows you the presence of pericardial effusion posterior to the left ventricular free wall. Pericarditis can be classified based on the clinical presentation, etiology, and presumed relation to hypersensitivity or autoimmunity. The clinical classification include acute pericarditis, subacute pericarditis, and chronic pericarditis. Acute pericarditis, when it occurs less than six weeks, subacute pericarditis, six weeks to six months, and chronic pericarditis when it is more than six months. Etiologic classification include infectious and non-infectious process. Infectious pericarditis can be due to viral, pyogenic, tuberculous, fungal, and other infections like syphilis, protozoal, and parasitic infections. Non-infectious pericarditis may be due to acute myocardial infarction, uremia, neoplasia, which include primary and metastatic tumors to the pericardium, myxedema, elevated cholesterol, chylopericardium, trauma, aortic dissection, with leakage into pericardial sac, post irradiation, familial Mediterranean fever, familial pericarditis, acute idiopathic pericarditis, Whipple's disease, and sarcoidosis. Pericarditis presumably related to hypersensitivity or autoimmunity are the following rheumatic fever collagen vascular disease, drug-induced, 
cause cardiac injury. The latter includes postmyocardial infarction pericarditis, also known as the Dressler syndrome, postpericardiotomy, posttraumatic pericarditis. There is no specific treatment for pericarditis. Bed rest and anti-inflammatory treatment with aspirin, ibuprofen, or endomethacin can be administered. If the patient is unresponsive to the above medications, colchicine may be tried for 3 months. Glucocorticoids can be given to suppress the clinical manifestations of acute pericarditis in patients who have failed therapy with anti-inflammatory treatment. Full-dose glucocorticoids should be given for only 2-4 to four days and then gradually tapered. In cases of multiple frequent in disabling recurrences that continue for more than two years and not prevented by continuing colchicine and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and are not controlled by glucocorticoids, acetyoprine or anakinra, which is an interleukin-1 beta receptor antagonist, may be tried. Pericardial stripping is rarely necessary and may not always terminate recurrences. Cardiac tamponade is the accumulation of fluid in the pericardial space in a quantity sufficient to cause serious obstruction of the inflow of blood into the ventricles. The most common causes are idiopathic pericarditis, tuberculous pericarditis, or bleeding into the pericardial space after leakage from an aortic dissection, cardiac operation, trauma, and treatment with anticoagulants. The three principal features of cardiac tamponade, also known as Bex triad, are hypotension, soft or absent heart sounds, and jugular venous distension. The amount of fluid necessary to produce cardiac tamponade may be as small as 200 ml when the fluid develops rapidly or more than 2 liters in slowly developing effusions. Cardiac tamponade should be considered in sudden enlargement of cardiac silhouette, hypotension, and elevated jugular venous pressure. The ECG usually reveal reduction in amplitude of QRS complexes and electrical alternance of the P, QRS, or T waves. This table lists the features that distinguishes acute cardiac tamponade from constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, right ventricular myocardial infarction, and effusive constrictive pericarditis. Differentiation is based on the clinical features, electrocardiographic, echocardiographic, and CT and MRI findings. Cardiac catheterization may be necessary if other findings are non diagnostic. An important clinical clue in cardiac tamponade is the presence of paradoxical pulse, defined as a decrease of greater than normal systolic blood pressure upon inspiration, which is more than 10 mm mercury. It may be detected by palpating weakness or disappearance of the arterial pulse during inspiration. Since both ventricles share the pericardial sac, inspiratory enlargement of the right ventricle 
causes left wall barging of the interventricular septum, resulting in compression and reduction of the left ventricular volume, stroke volume, and blood pressure. Paradoxical pulse may also occur in constrictive pericarditis, hypovolemic shock, acute and chronic airway disease, and right ventricular infarction. Prompt diagnosis of cardiac tamponade is life-saving if immediate treatment is done. The diagnosis can be established by transthoracic echo, which will show the diastolic collapse of the right atrium and the right ventricle. Collapse of the right atrium occurs during late diastole to early systole, while right ventricular collapse occurs during early diastole. Right atrial collapse is more sensitive while right ventricular collapse is more specific for the diagnosis of cardiac tamponade. This image shows a circumferential pericardial effusion. The arrow points to the echo-free space between the parietal and visceral pericardium. In the presence of cardiac tamponade, the Doppler ultrasound shows marked increase in the tricuspid and pulmonic valve velocities during inspiration, whereas the pulmonic vein, mitral, and aortic valve flow velocities diminish. During expiration, the opposite occurs. The tricuspid valve and pulmonic valve velocities decrease with increase in the mitral valve, pulmonary veins, and aortic valve flow velocities. The significant increase in tricuspid valve velocity is more than 40% during inspiration, while in the mitral valve, it is more than 25% during expiration. This image show a two-dimensional subcostal view of the heart in a patient with cardiac tamponade showing right atrial and right ventricular indentation or collapse. In both the right atrial and right ventricular chambers, the indentation occurs during the relaxation or diastole when their pressure is lowest and transiently falls below the pericardial pressure. Cardiac tamponade is rapidly fatal if left untreated. In the presence of clinical manifestations of tamponade, pericardiocentesis using an apical parasternal or most commonly subsipoid approach must be carried out. Intravenous saline may be administered as patient is being readied for the procedure. This is to increase the intracavitary volume and further prevent collapse. Intrapericardial pressure if possible, should be measured before fluid is withdrawn and pericardial fluid be drained completely as possible. A small multi hole catheter may be advanced over the needle and inserted into the pericardial cavity, which is left in place if fluid reaccumulate. Surgical drainage through a limited subsipoid thoracotomy may be required in recurrent tamponade to remove loculated effusion and or when it is necessary to obtain tissue for diagnosis. 
Pericardial fluid should be analyzed for the presence of red blood cell and white blood cells, cytology, cultures, and TB PCR. Known or presumed viral cause of acute pericarditis has usually an antecedent upper respiratory tract infection. It is more common in young adults and presents with fever and precordial pain 10 to 12 days after a presumed viral illness. The fever precedes chest pain in contrast to acute myocardial infarction. Constitutional symptoms are usually mild to moderate and a pericardial friction rub is often audible. The course may last for a few days to four weeks, and the most frequent complication is recurrent pericarditis in one-fourth of patients. Acute pericarditis may develop after cardiac operation, blunt or penetrating cardiac trauma, perforation of the heart with a catheter, or rarely follows acute myocardial infarction. It mimics acute viral or idiopathic pericarditis and usually develops after one to four weeks after cardiac injury and recurrences may occur after two years or more following injury. Chronic pericardial effusions are sometimes encountered in patients without antecedent history of acute pericarditis. They may cause few symptoms per se, and their presence may be detected by finding of an enlarged cardiac silhouette on chest x-ray. The causes are the following, TB, myxedema, neoplasm, SLE, RA, mycotic infection, radiation to the chest, and chylopericardium. Aspiration and analysis of pericardial fluid is helpful in the diagnosis. Sanguinous fluid is seen in neoplasm, TB, renal failure, or in slow leakage from an aortic dissection. Pericardiosynthesis may resolve lard effusion. If with recurrence, pericardiectomy may be warranted. Intrapericardial installation of sclerosing agents may prevent reaccumulation. Chronic constrictive pericarditis is a consequence of acute fibrinous or serofibrinous pericarditis followed by obliteration of the pericardial cavity with formation of granulation tissue which subsequently contracts and forms a firm scar encasing the heart which may become calcified. This interfere with filling of the ventricles during mid to late diastole, but unimpeded during early diastole. The most common cause in developing nation is TB pericarditis. Other causes are mentioned earlier in the differential diagnosis of acute pericarditis. The basic physiologic abnormality is the inability of the ventricles to fill. Filling is unimpeded during early diastole but abruptly reduced when the elastic limit is reached. The ventricular and diastolic volume and stroke volume are subsequently reduced. And diastolic pressure in both ventricles and mean pressures in the atria pulmonary veins, and systemic veins are all elevated to similar levels, 
which is within 5 mm of one another. Constrictive pericarditis has a similar hemodynamic changes in cardiac tamponade, except that ventricular peeling is impeded throughout diastole in tamponade. Patients with chronic constrictive pericarditis present with weakness, fatigue, weight gain, increased abdominal girth, abdominal discomfort, and edema. Exertional dyspnea is often not severe. Distended cervical veins may remain so even after intensive diuretic treatment. On physical examination, failure of the jugular venous pressure to decline during inspiration can be observed, and this is known as the Kussmull sign. The latter also occur in TS, RV infarction, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. The pulse pressure is normal or reduced. Paradoxical pulse is seen in one-third of the cases. Congestive hepatomegaly, ascites, pleural effusion, splenomegaly are usually seen and more prominent than edema. The apical pulse is reduced and may retract in systole. This is also called the broadband sign. Heart sounds may be distant and an early third heart sound due to abrupt cessation of when ventricular feeling is heard, which is the pericardial knock. The electrocardiogram frequently displays low voltage of the QRS complexes and diffuse flattening or inversion of the T waves. AF or atrial fibrillation is seen in about one third of patients. The chest x ray shows a normal or a slightly enlarged heart, and sometimes pericardial calcification is seen. This is most commonly noted in patients with TB. The echocardiogram shows pericardial thickening, dilation of the inferior vena cava and hepatic veins, and a sharp halt in ventricular feeling in early diastole with normal ventricular systolic function. There is flattening of the left ventricular posterior wall during diastole. The transvalvular flow velocity in Doppler echo is similar to cardiac tamponade. During inspiration, there is exaggerated reduction of flow velocity in the pulmonary veins and across the mitral valve and a leftward shift of the ventricular septum. The opposite occurs during expiration. Diastolic flow velocity in the inferior vena cava into the RA and across the tricuspid valve increases in an exaggerated manner during inspiration and declines during expiration. Echocardiography cannot definitely establish or exclude the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. Cardiac CT scan and magnetic resonance imaging are more accurate. The latter is useful in evaluating myocardial involvement. Shown in this picture is a cardiac MRI image of a 51-year-old man who presented with symptoms of constriction. Coronal ECG gated T1 weighted SE image shows abnormally thickened pericardium outlined by epicardial 
and anterior mediastinal fat. Pericardial resection is the only definitive treatment of constrictive pericarditis and should be as complete as possible. Dietary sodium restriction and diuretics are useful during preoperative preparation. The operative mortality is in the range of 5 to 10 percent and surgical treatment should be done as early as possible. Tuberculous pericardial disease is a common cause of chronic pericardial infusion in developing world. It should be considered in patients with known tuberculosis with HIV and with fever, chest pain, weight loss, and enlargement of cardiac silhouette of undetermined origin. If pericardial biopsy specimen show granulomas with cachation, anti-TB is indicated. If biopsy shows thickened pericardium after two to four weeks of anti-TB, pericardiectomy should be carried out to prevent constriction. The medical treatment is a four-drug therapy combination of INH, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, and etambutol for two months, followed by two-drug therapy, which include isoniazid and rifampicin for the next four months.